Okay, I'm going to shift gears, and obviously this is uh, actually a direct effect of this topic being so vast, and there's so much to discuss, and it's so important, and uh, um, there's just too much to say, and I'm really amazed to see this, this report by UNDP LAC. Kudos to Marcelo for making it happen. It's really important that international institutions bring it to uh, the attention of everyone because it, I mean now all the researchers can be in the room and, and I can spend all our times going on about these uh, measurements and whatever, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, but it needs to get out and, and this is, so congratulations on the report. I'm going to look at the other side. I'm actually going to look at uh, what do you do about inequalities. Uh, so, um, and this is, I'm going to talk about distribution that it says there in the, in the title. I'm going to, Anna and, and Marcella and Diana have already gone through this. Does inequality lead to political violence? Most likely, yes. The common sense tells you that it's, it, it, yes. Uh, there, and there's evidence going from issues. Um, a lot of it depends on how you measure inequality. So we have evidence that land inequality matters, class divides, horizontal inequality, relative deprivation, polarization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And each one of these uh, bullet points is vast amounts of literature on every single one of them. And there's a lot of debates about which way it goes, what matters, mechanisms, et cetera. But the holy grail here is, does inequality cause political violence? The causal point is still up for grabs. And the evidence is very thin on the ground. Um, and the main argument that people make is, well, inequality exists in most societies, and only a handful of countries have experienced serious violence, etc. Uh, and then there's arguments about, well, it's also difficult. I mean, we know that grievances are associated with whole forms of violence and um, discontent and social tensions, but causing it requires mechanisms to actually make it happen. And it's not cheap and it requires organization and it's, it's not that straightforward. And therefore we kind of have these results that inequality is unlikely to actually be a trigger for political violence, but it definitely matters. It's there in the context and it matters. So what, we, what then we start thinking about is giving, giving uh, the, um, uh, all this, this literature, and, and this is a question then for Marcella and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the groups in policy working on these issues. Well, is it really then about absolute inequality? Are we actually measure the right thing here? Um, and at the end of the day, inequality only matters if people are concerned about inequality. And it, it, this varies across societies. Not all societies are concerned necessarily about levels of inequality, and there's definitely thresholds upon, at a certain point, inequality starts mattering. And so we ask, uh, we start looking not just at absolute levels of inequality, but we start asking people about their preferences for redistribution. Is there something in their countries that needs to be changed in which inequality makes a difference? And then what we find the result is actually what matters is not inequality per se, so the Gini coefficient, et cetera, how you measure, but actually the preferences for the redistribution, whether people have high or level levels of preferences. Uh, because in societies with high levels of tolerance for inequality, a economic example is like, you know, the US versus Europe, uh, preferences for uh, tolerances for inequality are very different in these cases, then uh, if this doesn't shift, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if inequality rises, if people don't understand that it's rising and makes a difference for them. Uh, and just to give you some examples, what we have here is actually in Latin America, I chose the Latin American case, and we see, we, can, we, we compare, um, this is about protests, they're not violent protests as, as Anna uh, mentioned already, these are not, not necessarily turn into high levels of violence. And we compare res, uh, preferences uh, for redistribution against the Gini coefficient and we find it's the preferences that matter. The absolute inequality does not matter. And it may explain then why we don't see a causal effect, is because we're not presumably asking the right things to the, to the people. And. But this then leads us back to an even older debate. If we then assume that redistribution is important, then this leads us back to a debate that comes back to the, the beginning of social science. Um, and then we ask the question, what can we do about it? Then the obvious policy solution is we redistribute, right? Uh, so we have policies that redistribute resources, power, etc., might solve the problem. And this goes back to the old idea underlying the European welfare system. Uh, 
which was redistribution is at the heart of why it was built. It goes back to Germany in the 19th century. And um, a variety of uh, researchers since then have made this point that maybe it is about redistribution. And I, d I did some work before for India where we actually tested whether redistributive transfers against the use of police, which one is better. And for the case of India, I, I haven't done it for Latin America so I couldn't show it, but for the case of India we see that, for instance, if we have one riot, this is riots, so these are quite violent. If we have, if we need to reduce riots, is it better to have uh, redistributive welfare policies or police? And actually, it turns out police is inefficient in the long term and much more expensive. Uh, we ask similar questions, uh, but this is uh, on civil wars in Latin America, and we find a similar result. And uh, we have, I just put this graph here, which shows the beginning of the rise in welfare. Uh, payments are mostly cash transfers in Latin America against the occurrence of civil wars. And we find that, uh, you see the curve, the curve is very telling, and we find uh, that cash transfers explains 50% of the reduction in civil wars in Latin America in this period. So the result is causal and 50% of that reduction is explained by the cash transfer programs. And uh, we find that this is because uh, redistribution is redistributive policies do reduce absolute inequality, but most, most the, the strongest result is actually reduces, uh, has an effect in perceptions of inequality, because these are government programs that generate a whole debate and discussion about why inequality, it, it just makes the point inequality being reduced, so it's not so much, the, there are evidence about absolute levels, but it's basically about perceptions, and it's about also what these programs have done is increase trust in state institutions, and this is a big part of the story. So what we have here is the whole story, we'll go back to the old age story, that actually what redistributive policies do is improve the social contract between government and citizens and therefore eventually re uh, lead it to a reduction in, in uh, uh, violence. I'm not sure, so I'll, I'll, I'll actually stop here, I won't go much into that. I am not sure this is the solution for everything, uh, but just making the suggestion that maybe looking again, I know this is very old fashioned and stuff, but looking again at welfare policy and redistribution might actually have some, uh, some buyouts still there, and, and in terms of, especially in terms of improving social contracts. So I'll leave it at that, and congratulations again, Marcella. <laughs> Thanks.